Welcome to the Cambridge Financial Podcast with Bert Salazar, CEO at Cambridge Financial Partners, LLC. This podcast is all about tax-preferred retirement planning, economics, financial risk management, and achieving a risk-free and successful financial life. Now, your host, Bert Salazar. Bert Salazar. Bert Salazar. Hey, good day, everyone. Welcome to another Cambridge uh, podcast. As always, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm excited about sharing information and providing education to all all of you that are joining us on these podcasts on a weekly basis. Uh, Today, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail into a podcast that um, I am going to be calling uh, The Three Financial Buckets. Now, although most of you have heard me, Uh, Over the last uh, year or so, talking at times uh, regarding the different financial buckets that are available for all of us in the marketplace, I want to dedicate a little bit more time as to how it is that we at Cambridge uh, use the financial buckets uh, in order to maximize the internal rate of return for our clients and also to mitigate uh, some of the major tax issues that the vast majority of the clients that we engage are going to be facing uh, at some point in time in the future. Now, because we are a retirement strategist firm, uh, it is very important for us to truly understand uh, the taxation of all clients' assets in order to make certain that we can address each and every issue uh, uh, conservatively, conservatively and from a business perspective. Now, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, net present value calculation, future value calculations, which are the internal uh, things that we do at Cambridge um, as we attempt to to maximize the internal rate of return for our clients. Now, net present value calculations, it, it's primarily the difference between the present value of all cash flows and outflows uh, over a period of time, uh, period of time in the future. And what we try to do with all the financial buckets that we deal with is how to, how to have the right amount of uh, assets uh, in each uh, financial bucket in order to reduce and or eliminate uh, tax liability in the future. So uh, there are three major buckets that we deal with at Cambridge when it comes to managing uh, assets and taxation for our clients. And that is the taxable bucket, the tax deferred bucket, and the tax free bucket. Now, the tax and the taxable bucket is one that we see a lot of our clients have a way too much money in that bucket. And that bucket is comprised primarily of those assets that are going to be taxable every year. So if you have a money market account, if you have a, a certificate of uh, deposit, uh, a CD, uh, if you have traditional mutual funds that uh, you may own and that uh, you invest in on a regular basis, obviously the money that you're putting into these accounts are after-tax money, so you have already paid taxes on those accounts. And then as the accounts grow every single year, then you will be receiving a 1099, uh, which you will have to report on your tax return for the IRS. Now, uh, whenever we do audits for our clients and we do tax audits along those lines, uh, the first thing that we find out is that the vast majority of the clients that we engage have way too much money in the taxable bucket. Now, uh, intelligently speaking, I would argue that uh, none of us uh, should have more than six months of assets. Uh, or liquidity uh, in the taxable bucket. Now, although the taxable bucket is not a very good bucket from a taxable standpoint, because every single year you're going to have to pay taxes on the growth of that mar- uh, that bucket, uh, it is a good bucket to have uh, because of the fact that it's very liquid. So if you have an emergency or if you have a business opportunity, having uh, assets in your taxable bucket is very critical for those of us that are listening to this podcast today. I would recommend to many of my clients to not have uh, more than than six months of uh, expenses in their taxable bucket. Now, I have had clients that I visited with and they have had anywhere between 18 months and 24 months uh, of assets in the taxable bucket. And when I asked them, you know, why it is and that they have it there, that just they just don't have an answer. Uh, 
So if you don't have an answer, if you don't have a business aptitude as to the reasoning behind keeping that much money in the taxable bucket, then I do suggest that you want to minimize it and leave it to a maximum of six months. Now, obviously, if you happen to be the type of client that are always uh, looking for business opportunities, then perhaps you know, having more like a year would be suitable for you. But uh, the vast majority of the clients that we engage, uh, six months is, is more than enough. Now, the next bucket is the tax deferred bucket. Now, the tax deferred bucket is one that most of us have a tendency to understand. And that's your, that's your tax deferral. Those are your 401ks. Uh, your IRAs, your 403Bs, your your uh, SEPs, uh, your SIMPLES, um, uh, you know, your simple 401k if you happen to be putting money away on a pre-tax basis. And the reason why that bucket is very, very important is that the vast majority of Americans use the tax deferred bucket as a savings and retirement tool. Uh, and the reason why that's important, because the money that they put in in the tax-deferred bucket goes in on a pre-tax basis. So if you're making $100,000 a year, you put $10,000 in your pre-tax bucket, then you're only going to be paying taxes on $90,000. So uh, the money is going to go in on a pre-tax basis. The money is going to grow tax-deferred. And then when you pull the money out, uh, you're going to have to pay taxes on, on the whole thing. Now, uh, most uh, most clients that invest in these buckets and most Americans that put a lot of money into these buckets, we find many a times that especially for those uh, clients that we engage, which are fairly successful uh, from a financial perspective, they're putting way too much money in the tax deferred bucket. Now, I can understand why it is that they do that, because obviously they're able to take a tax deduction in the year that they're making the contribution. Uh, what they're failing to understand is that uh, they're pretty much getting a loan from the IRS when they take a tax deduction, because basically what the IRS says is that, yes, I will allow you to put money on a pre-tax basis in this bucket. I am going to limit uh, not only the amount of money that you can actually put into the bucket, but I'm also going to limit access uh, f to that money uh, from you uh, and only going to give you access under certain circumstances, like making sure you're at least 59 and a half um, as far as your age is concerned, or if you happen to have some exigent circumstances, like if, you, if you're a first-time home buyer or if you become disabled or if you happen to die prematurely, then, you know, those are some of the exceptions to the rules. But the vast majority of the time when you put money in the tax deferred bucket, you're making a long term investment. You're putting money over the over many years, 20, 30, sometimes even 40 years. Uh, and then obviously the IRS is going to give you the ability to put the money in on a pre-tax basis. Now, the challenge with putting money away on a pre-tax basis is that uh, not only uh, are you putting money on a tax deferred basis, but also um, you also have to remember that you are uh, delaying the tax liability as well. So when you are deferring the tax, you're also deferring the tax liability. Now, unless you feel that taxes are going to be lower in the future, and, and based on my perspective, the only way that your taxes are going to be lower in the future will be primarily if you happen to be a financial failure in life. Because uh, when you take a look at all that's going on in our country, our national debt, the unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicare Part D, which exceeds $114 trillion and counting, there's a very, very high probability that taxes are going to be a lot higher in the future. Even if taxes were higher by just 1% or 2%, you know, having money in a tax-deferred bucket uh, can be detrimental to you. So whenever you, we do any type of planning for our clients, not only do we want to limit the amount of contributions and the amount of uh, growth in the taxable bucket, we also want to limit the amount of contributions and, the, and, and also limit the amount of growth in the tax-deferred bucket. Uh, because at the end of the day, when you retire, 
whether you want to or not, especially when you get to the age of uh, required minimum distributions, which is 70 and a half at this point in time, and that is bound to change at any point in time in the future, uh, you're going to have to pay taxes on the entire growth in your entire contributions to the tax deferred bucket. Also remember that because of the fact that your money, you're putting the money in on a pre-tax basis, you cannot take any type of uh, tax deductions uh, to any losses that you incur in your tax deferred bucket. So back in 2008, when the, when the traditional 401k became a 201k because clients lost uh, almost uh, 50% of their investments, you could not take a tax deduction on the losses of your 401k because of the fact that the contributions were being made on a pre-tax on a pre-tax basis from a business perspective. So it's very critical to understand how the rules of engagement work uh, when it comes to the tax deferred bucket. Now, the more money that you have in that tax deferred bucket, uh, the higher the distribution rate will be. Uh, and, and, is, and the distribution rate, once you get to the age of 70 and a half, will be pretty much mandated by the IRS code. And the rules of engagement when it comes to how much money you need to take uh, once you hit the age of 70 and a half. And there, obviously, I have done a podcast on what the distributions are. Once you get to 70 and a half, uh, you're going to have to take uh, your previous uh, year's account value in your tax deferred bucket. And then you're going to have to divide that into the uniform lifetime uh, table, which would be 27.4. So you take, let's say, you know, 500,000 divided by 27.4 will give you $18,000 and change that you are required to take uh, from your tax deferred bucket. Now, the tax deferred bucket comes with a bunch of different penalties that you, all of us, uh, need to be aware of. Uh, you do have the 59 and a half uh, rule, which means that if you take any money out of this bucket prior to age 59 and a half, not only are you going to have to pay taxes on the distribution, but you're also going to have to pay uh, a 10% penalty for early distribution. Now, once you hit the age of 70 and a half, then you're going to have an additional mandatory distribution, which now forces you, whether you want to or not, to start taking money out of that tax deferred bucket. If you fail to take distributions out of the tax deferred bucket at age 70 and a half, not only will you have to pay taxes on the amount of distribution that you should have taken, but you didn't take, but you're also going to be forced to pay a 50 percent penalty. Yes, you heard me right. A 50 percent penalty on that distribution that you should have taken, but you didn't You didn't at that point in time. So understanding the rules of engagement in the tax deferred bucket is very, very critical to all of you. Now, the reason why we at Cambridge uh, try to manage both the taxable bucket and the tax deferred bucket is that we want to minimize your tax liability. And if you, if you have, and if we have, the right amount of assets in your taxable bucket, and most important, the right amount of assets in your tax deferred bucket, uh, you may actually be able to have your cake and eat it too. You see, we use a lot of net present value calculations that gives us the ability to determine what would be the optimum amount of assets that our clients uh, should have in the taxable buckets and the tax deferred buckets as well. And the reason for that is that if we're able to optimize uh, those two buckets, we may very well be able to take distributions out of the taxable bucket and the tax deferred bucket without incurring any tax liabilities. Now you would say, well, wait a minute, Bert, you just said that in the tax deferred bucket, when you put the money in, the money goes in pre-tax, then the money grows tax deferred, and then when you pull it out, you have to pay taxes on the contributions and on the um, uh, increases of the growth of that investment. Didn't you just say that a few minutes ago? And the answer is, yes, I did. Uh, of course, you have to pay taxes on the distribution. But if you're able to manage the distribution of the tax deferred bucket properly, and if you're able to do so 
with the optimum amount of money in the tax deferred bucket that may be suitable based on your standard deductions that are all also accrued uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so every single year, your standard deduction will more than likely go up. Over the last 10 to 15 years, the average uh, standard deduction ha- has gone up by an average of 3%. So if you have someone who's age 50 today, and the standard deduction today for married filing jointly is $24,000. If we're able to project that into the future at a a 3% uh, growth uh, of the standard deduction, then we're going to end up with north of $30,000 in uh, standard deductions by the time uh, a traditional American family married filing jointly reaches the age of 65 or perhaps even five years later at the age of 70. So if I have the right amount of assets in your tax uh, deferred bucket, then I will be able to pull uh, sufficient assets out of that bucket and offset the tax liability based on the standard deduction at that point in time. Now, if I uh, overfunded the bucket and I have more money in the bucket by the time I reach the age of 70 or you reach the age of 70 and a half, and now the IRS is forcing you to take more money than what you should have taken under your standard deduction calculations, then yes, you will have to pay additional taxes on that distribution. But if I can offset it, uh, then it becomes a total wash. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of rules that are governed in the taxable bucket and the tax deferred bucket. Uh, So we try um, every single year to manage those uh, on behalf of our clients. And we do a number of calculations. We do calculations that are based on Uh, uh, future value calculations of 5%, 6%, 7%, sometimes even up to 8%. And then we redo those calculations every single year for our clients because some clients may uh, see a much higher rate of return on one one year compared to the other. And, (coughs) excuse me, and the reason why we try to do that is, again, how do we have the ability to maximize the amount of contributions take deductions on those contributions, also maximize the internal rate of return on those contributions uh, inside the tax deferred bucket, but then minimize and or eliminate uh, all the distributions from the tax deferred back bucket, which otherwise you would have had to pay taxes on. So obviously the tax, uh, the management of the taxable bucket of the, and the tax deferred bucket is very critical for what we do for our clients uh, here at Cambridge. Now, the final bucket that I want to talk to all of you about, it is the tax-free bucket or the tax-preferred bucket, as we call it. Now, anything that does not go into the taxable bucket or the tax-deferred bucket should definitely go into the tax-free or the tax-preferred bucket. Now, uh, you would think that uh, the following assets uh, form part of the tax-preferred asset uh, from a business perspective, and those assets would be, you know, municipal bond funds. Uh, The money that you put in grows uh, goes in after tax. The money grows uh, tax-free there forward. So the money grows tax-deferred, you pull it out tax-free. So from an asset perspective, municipal bond funds are part of the tax-free bucket. In addition to that, uh, Roth IRAs are part of that bucket as well. The money that you put in into a Roth IRA is after tax money. The money grows tax deferred, uh, and then when you pull it out, uh, you pull it out on a tax-free basis. The third asset that goes into that bucket uh, would be your traditional Roth uh, 401ks. So you're able to put more money because now you're investing in a corporate um, um, qualified plan. Uh, in this case, it would be a 401k. So you're able to put more money in a Roth 401k than you would in a traditional Roth IRA. Uh, the money grows uh, tax deferred because it's after tax money, obviously, contributions. The money grows tax deferred, and then when you pull it out, you pull it out also tax free. So municipal bond funds, Roth IRAs, and Roth 401ks are all assets that fit into the tax-free bucket. 
There's a fourth asset that fits into into the tax-free or the tax-preferred bucket, which are the 7702 plans. And these are cash value life insurance uh, plans uh, that we make available to, to many of our clients or have already uh, maximized their contributions to their Roth IRAs or for the one, for Roth 401ks and to some extent uh, municipal bond funds. Now, the reason why we feel very strongly about 7702 plans is because 7702 plans under the IRS code uh, enjoy uh, features and benefits that no other product uh, in the U.S. arsenal uh, enjoys from a taxable and liquidity perspective. So in a 7702 plan, uh, you would have all the liquidity that you would have in a traditional taxable bucket, which is the first one that we covered, uh, but you also have the tax-preferred benefits of the tax-free bucket, which is the one that we're covering today. Now, what I like about the 7702 plans, uh, and, and many of my clients enjoy, is the fact that you have the ability to put a lot more money in a, um, in a 7702 plan than you would in your traditional Roth IRAs or Roth 401ks. Now, obviously, you know, we also do the calculations to make certain that, that we're using the 7702 plan as a, as a plan that is suitable based on the goals and objectives of the individual clients. Now, um, in the tax preferred bucket, as I have just stated, uh, you have four major products. You have your municipal bond funds, you have your Roth IRAs, your Roth 401ks, and the 7702 plans. And the reason why I have just mentioned them again is out of the four uh, products and assets that go into the tax-free and or tax-preferred bucket, only three are totally exempt uh, from any tax liability. And that would be your Roth IRAs, your Roth 401ks, and also uh, your 7702 plans. Now, although municipal bond funds are received uh, federal income tax-free, uh, they do get added on uh, to the provisional income calculations in order to determine uh, what percentage of your Social Security benefits uh, may be taxed in retirement. Uh, some of you may wonder and may think that your Social Security benefits uh, in retirement are going to be totally tax-free. And, and the answer is that for most of you uh, that are listening to my podcast on a weekly basis, uh, the answer uh, is no. Uh, the vast majority of your Social Security benefits, unless you do proper planning, the vast majority of your Social Security benefits are going to be taxable in retirement. As a matter of fact, I would argue that up to 85% of all your Social Security benefits um, will more than likely be taxable in retirement for the type of clients that we deal with. Now, if you have time on your side of the ledger and you have the ability to put together the type of planning uh, that we do for our clients uh, by creating a customized uh, tax preferred retirement blueprint, then there's a high probability that your Social Security benefits are not going to be taxable and that you're going to be able to, to create a tax free uh, retirement life. And, and, and that would give you uh, a tremendous uh, capability in the marketplace because one of the major eroding factors that most of us are going to have to deal with in the future, especially for those of us that have been fairly successful in the past, uh, is going to be taxation. So if I'm able to reduce uh, your tax liability in retirement, then by the same token, uh, I'm actually putting more money in your pocket without you having to take any additional financial risk. Now, uh, whenever we engage clients for the first time, the first thing that we do for them is uh, do a complete uh, a complete uh, financial review of all their assets, all their investments, uh, how much money they're putting away, uh, what is the growth potential of the current assets that they have in place in order to figure out what would be the net present value calculation of all those assets um, in between or that are earmarked uh, for the taxable bucket, the tax deferred bucket, and the tax free bucket. Now, once we do all those calculations, then we're going to come up uh, with a an investment strategy 
as to how much money to put into each and every one of those buckets in order uh, to make certain that we can mitigate all those tax liabilities uh, in the future from a business uh, perspective. Along the lines uh, of um, the the customized tax preferred retirement blueprint that we do for our clients, we also uh, provide our clients with an annual social security report uh, which uh, will uh, detail uh, when will be the best possible time for our clients to to uh, start uh, taking distributions uh, out of their Social Security benefits. We're also going to do tax forwarding report that's going to help us determine, you know, what's the most amount of money that each and every one of us and each and every one of you uh, should have in the taxable bucket and the tax deferred bucket. Uh, we're also going to do some economic models uh, depending on the internal rate of return that we may be able to to get on those uh, assets along those lines. And then for those of you that become clients of ours, ours and obviously you're going to have access uh, to our member uh, coaching webinars series that we do uh, the third Saturday of every single month, uh, except for a couple of months out of the year in which, you know, we are a firm that, that believe very strongly that information without education always leads to failure. So, you know, we're, uh, we're doing these webinars in order to be able to provide education and to provide opportunities for all of you to ask questions uh, depending on your specific uh, con- circumstances uh, and issues and concerns. So uh, from a business pers- perspective, if we, if we want to do it the right way, uh, what we would try to accomplish is how can we put the right amount of money in, in the taxable bucket? How can we put the, just the right amount of uh, money and assets in the tax deferred bucket? And how can we distribute from those buckets in a way that is not going to provide any tax liability for our clients in, in the future? Along those lines, we want to make certain that all of you uh, can maximize your contribution to the tax preferred bucket because if you can generate 100% of your income out of the uh, tax deferred bucket and the tax free bucket whereby you pay no federal income tax whatsoever, then it really doesn't matter where taxes are going to be in the future because you're still going to have the the ability to maximize uh, the distribution rate on all of your assets on a tax preferred basis. So again, this may be a little bit uh, confusing to some of you because of the verbiage and the, and the wording that I have used, but I think it's important for all of us to understand that, you know, if you are working with a retirement strategist or if you're working, some of you may be working with uh, some financial advisors out there, make sure that you have discussions with them, you know, regarding provisional income calculation. You know, what would be the right amount of uh, uh, income that I need to have in my taxable bucket? What would be the right amount of income that uh, I should have in, in my tax deferred bucket? And then how do we address and, and what kind of products and services would we would we have in the tax preferred or the tax free bucket uh, in order to enhance uh, a tax preferred distribution upon retirement? So these are questions that all of you should be discussing with your financial advisors. If you're not discussing these uh, issues and concerns and questions with your financial advisors, then, then you should. And, and you should not have to ask them. They should be bringing these issues and concerns to you, uh, and they should be bringing these issues and concerns to the table uh, on a regular basis as you're doing your reviews with your financial advisors, because uh, if they're not bringing this uh, issue, these issues to the table, and these issues are critically important to you and to your family in retirement, then perhaps uh, it is time to consider uh, changing to another financial advisor or to a retirement strategist uh, that specializes uh, in in what we have discussed uh, today in this podcast. Uh, again, uh, and this is something that I share with all of you uh, whenever I do a podcast, uh, my number one goal and the goal of my family is to kind of change the way that you see things. Because when you change the way that you see things, the things that you see change. Again, if you have any questions regarding what we've talked about today or any other issues or, or concerns, please feel free to uh, reach out to me at area code 786 
766-1042. Or you can also send me an email at Bert, B-E-R-T, dot Salazar, S-A-L-A-Z-A-R, at Cambridge, F.S. and Frank, P.S. and Paul, LLC.com, or you can use my personal email, which is uh, Bert, B-E-R-T, at BertSalazar.com. Again, thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time today, and I look forward to speaking to you soon.